Okay, so then again, welcome everybody for coming on to Geoengineering Free Canada's call tonight. It's uh, our legendary <laughs> geo talk, <laughs> we call it that way. Uh, so we started our group back in uh, November of 2022. And uh, uh, the story behind Geoengineering Free Canada is my uh, travels down to, um, or actually into Kelowna. So I was traveling Highway 33 that is coming from the uh, from the Kootenays into, into Kelowna. And I was looking up the skies and I couldn't believe what I saw. And this, this was really absolutely too much. <laughs> so then I thought we got to do something about it. And this is, uh, this is how um, Geoengineering Free Canada got kicked off actually, uh, together with a friend of mine out of the Kootenays. And uh, so yeah, and here we are. And then uh, this uh, friend, this particular friend, she found Jim's website, uh, Jim's climateviewer.com website. And I made the contact and here we are. <laughs> we are since then we're really good friends and I really appreciate, appreciate his work so much because it's absolutely incredible. Um, and then through Jim and I found Paula through Jim, I found Nick, actually no, Nikki, Nikki contacted us. She uh, sent us an email and I was like, hmm, an email from Nevada? Where the heck is this coming from? So who, who is this? So she, um, she obviously found us. Uh, so we have obviously done a good job uh, promoting our group. And uh, so this is uh, how we got in contact with Nikki, NikkiFlorioBeHeroic.com. So this is another website that you guys really should check out. And then another, uh, yeah, through Jim, then we found Paula. And through Paula, we found Alana and Nikki. Uh, we found Alana. So this is how it's all connected. And this is how it all started. And so I, I'm really, I'm absolutely thrilled uh, that... Um, we have uh, amazing people here. And then again, through um, Alana, last but not least, we found Jean, Jean Manning. And Jean Manning is the author of, um, a co-author of Angels Don't Play This Harp. And uh, so, and this is how we found each other. And since then it's, it's been, it's became a really great movement and in the geoengineering world, I, I believe so. And uh, yeah, so I would, uh, there is still people coming on. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> so that's really cool. Um, yeah, so Alana, welcome. Welcome to the show tonight. And I would like to have you introduce yourself, please, because you you probably will do such a, an amazing job and much better than I ever will. Please, the floor is yours. Okay, can you remind me how long the show is? How long this is? Uh, so I, I will, we schedule it for two hours, but uh, okay. it's, if okay. it's going, you know, two hours, then it's going two hours. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, and I brought a PowerPoint in case I needed it. It's just something I'll kind of whip through and use this and that. But uh, I don't have to do that. I just, I don't know the level of uh, knowledge here uh, as far as how much people know about uh, geoengineering itself. Uh, just let me know. All right. Okay. So I want to see it. Huh? You would I like, like to see it. <laughs> okay. I like to All see right. it. <laughs> so um, just briefly, uh, I've been in this movement, gosh, not as long as Jim. Uh, I came on maybe maybe 14 or 15 years ago, I came into it. And um, I mainly came through Clifford Carnicum, the independent scientist who was working on collecting data uh, back in the, I'd say from the mid nineties on. And um, he began the study of Morgellons in 1999, uh, when he realized that these fibers were falling from the sky in the wake of the jets in Northern New Mexico uh, that were leaving uh, long trails, uh, unlike a contrail, it was um, long lasting and turned into a, a sort of thin cirrus cloud cover. So from that, he, he had dishes out and he was collecting uh, whatever was coming down. He was doing, chem oh, because his background is primarily chemistry and electromagnetics, he was doing a lot with uh, chemicals to figure out exactly what was going on. 
uh, uh, he knew it didn't look too good because he could read those uh, chemical signatures coming out the backs of jets and the signatures looked, um, he didn't know exactly which chemicals they were, but they certainly were not ice crystals and water vapor and particulate matter. So um, that's where I started. I met him at a breakfast uh, that somebody invited me to thinking that I might want to talk with him because at that time I was writing a series of books that are actually fictional works uh, I chose to do it in fiction because it's about the United States of America, uh, which was completely thrown off course with uh, John Kennedy's uh, very public assassination. And so um, the, I, I, was, I had files on everything you can possibly imagine because I was digging, digging in the dirt, uh, as, as Peter Gabriel sang years ago. I was looking to see what was really going on in the United States because I knew that uh, we were being lied to. Uh, so while doing that, um, I had a file on chemtrails and I had a file on HARP, the High Frequency auroral, uh, Active Auroral Research Project. So uh, at that point, to show you how ignorant I was, I didn't even know they were connected yet. Uh, I hadn't put that together. Uh, and so I started working with uh, Clifford after the breakfast, and uh, because I had a biology undergrad, um, it was my second major, I was just a few hours short of getting a BS, um, I I could look through the microscope and know what I was looking at, and, uh, and, and we began to see what now is known as synthetic biology. So um, I wrote a chapter on Clifford and to my knowledge, it is the most extensive written work on his work to this date, which is a very sad commentary on this classified project called geoengineering uh, that we uh, just don't know anything about, uh, very little about. Uh, even this morning, I was called by a media person in, Germ in, uh, in Holland and um, I could tell by his questions that he, he didn't know much of anything uh, and that his, his media had been uh, pretty mums of the word as well as, as ours. So, uh, you know, I'm constantly being shocked by that because of course I am interested in the truth I, as I'm talking to people now who have the same desire to know the truth. I mean, why would you waste your time uh, your limited life uh, on the earth, uh, lying. Why would you? Why would you want to do that? Because you won't find out what you need uh, before you die. Uh, that would um, avail you of uh, higher consciousness. Just didn't make any sense to me. Still doesn't. But we know how things go here. So uh, I now am writing books. That's a long time ago that Clifford and I met. We still talk on the phone for long periods and short periods. Um, talked to him yesterday and uh, he is doing new research because both he and I have seen the relationship between uh, the uh, what we saw as Morgellons, uh, badly named by the way, back in, uh, in the early 2000s is when I joined him around 2005 and um, and the uh, the vaccinations so-called that uh, have been going on for the last four years uh, there is a de definite connection it can be posited uh, chemically it can be looked at uh, from various angles and it is obvious that Morgellons and uh, Lyme disease, which preceded Morgellons by just a few years, both appear to have been developed at Fort Detrick, Maryland uh, base uh, there where the uh, there was a biowarfare lab, we now call them, but at that time it was a biological warfare, uh, biological lab. And, um, and so he is doing a great deal of experimentation right now regarding uh, this um, synthetic biology that is uh, being dropped from the sky 
and is also in the uh, inoculations that would include uh, infant inoculations. Uh, and so uh, it just seems to both of us, we're definitely on the same page with this, that uh, we kind of had to drop everything else we were doing and, uh, and, and really work hard on this because it looked to be that life on earth uh, is uh, under attack. And uh, it wasn't so much that we were interested in nailing exactly who was involved in the attack and who wasn't. It certainly, uh, there, was, there was enough history of the various wars we've had uh, from, world, from the world wars and Vietnam in the uh, 20th century and into the 21st century, the wars that we've had since mainly in the Middle East. Uh, that experimentation has been hot and heavy in the synthetic biology uh, that uh, has been going on. So that that's really kind of where I think I'm going to end up is, uh, you know, my first book came out in 2014, Chemtrails, Harp, and the Full Spectrum Dominance of Planet Earth. I call that a primer uh, for anyone who wants to understand Harp, uh, other ionosphere keters, in a simple way. I'm not nearly as thorough as Jim Lee is, uh, and I often send people to him to, to find out about how the jets work, what's going on in the jet engine, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I also send people to Harold Kautz, uh, Harold Kautz, he used to be Harold Kautz Vela, uh, but now he's Harold, Harold Kautz. He's a German scientist, uh, a multidisciplinary scientist, uh, and um, and he too uh, has very good material on the uh, combustion engines uh, in the jets, and um, and 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 he goes very far into synthetic biology, and particularly photons. So um, then, I, of course, you, we've mentioned Tony Pantelaresco. I've known Tony for years. Uh, you know, we've had what we've had two arguments in which I told him to basically leave me alone and not talk to me anymore. And then <laughs> we resolved that and got back on track. Uh, I love Tony. And uh, I don't know that people here know, but he has been viciously attacked uh, several months ago and is still recovering. So, um, you know, bless his heart. Uh, he has given everything to, particularly to individuals who write him, uh, I mean, I see it that we all sort of took a, a big uh, clump of the uh, the dragon in the living room, and uh, one person worked on you know the tail, another one worked on the front paws, another one worked on uh, the fire coming out of the mouth, and that sort of thing because it's such a big, such a big dragon uh, that uh, no one could have really taken it on themselves, and so. Clifford Carnicum has uh, done painstaking scientific method to uh, to isolate various components of this assault from the sky, uh, and um, he has mainly published through the internet all of his papers at carnicuminstitute.org. Uh, very important place. There are several, about a dozen recent papers up for his. Uh, what he's been studying recently as he works with uh, Dr. Anna Mihalcha, uh, MD, PhD, who lives uh, 15 miles from me. Wouldn't you know, life would just uh, have that happen. Uh, and I too work with the group in Australia that Anna works with uh, under uh, Dr. David Nixon, MD, uh, who are there doing live blood analysis through uh, a very sophisticated, uh, expensive, uh, microscope. So, uh, so you know, we all find each other eventually, even though it's a, not a centralized, top-down uh, scene like uh, you know, like Kaiser or something would have. Uh, we are all individuals. We are all bringing something different to the table, and we share it and we analyze it to the best of our ability. Given that we don't have those classified papers, <laughs> that would be nice to have. Um, so that's. That's sort of how it's gone for me over the last uh, 13, 15 years. Uh, had you asked me 20, 25 years ago, would I be writing 
serial uh, a series on geoengineering, I would I would not even have known how to respond. I wouldn't even have known the word. And even to this day, most people do not recognize the term geoengineering. They do recognize the term chemtrails when I mention it. And uh, you know, for anyone here, uh, obviously the uh, it, 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 the chemtrails are connected. The, the fellow this morning, the reason I'm laughing is he didn't even, he said, are chemtrails connected to geo, geoengineering? <laughs> I, I'm like, what? Uh, what am I dealing with here? So um, so that's that story. Let me see if I can get my PowerPoint up just to get ready. And you can uh, take it wherever you want uh, uh, because uh, I would like to show a few things. And really, please, please, uh, once I get going, I'm like an escalator, uh, you know, please feel free to guide me in different ways. Um, now, if I press play, this is where I get confused. All right, so if you could lead me through this, I have this up. I don't think you can see this yet, can you? Uh, no, so I made you a uh, co-host, Alana. So when you go on the bottom of your of your screen, there is a tagline and there's a green button. It reads share screen. Right. So when you click on share screen, then you can pull it up. Well, it's interesting. Uh, you say there's a green button and this happened to me before. I do not see a green button. It and should I'm be wondering. next to participants, then chat, then share screen. It's got an up arrow icon. If you put your mouse near the bottom of Zoom, it'll pop up if it's not there. Okay, Just so I'm seeing mute, stop video, security, reactions, apps, whiteboards, notes, more. And then I see leave. That's it, Jim. That's all I see. You're on your Macintosh, aren't you? I am, but I'm not in the, should I do the full window? Yeah, whenever you share a screen, you want to share the the entire screen, not an app. But should I press the play button on my uh, PowerPoint at this point before I go into this? I it haven't No, that. I wouldn't. I would just go ahead and oh. you have a second monitor. No, I'm I'm a poor girl here. Oh, <laughs> here I am with three monitors thinking. Oh my gosh. Oh, okay, now I've got go the full screen and there's the share screen. So I'm going to press it. There the green go. one. Rock on. Right. Okay. All right. Now, um, keynote. Yeah, this is it. Okay. So I'm pressing keynote, the, where my uh, PowerPoint is. Uh, but I don't see what's this. Oh, I see. Not half of it. And only oh. so you can see half of it. Now I yeah right this is because I'm not in it actually I want to go oh, back. I want to get out of this uh, how do I do that Jim mm -hmm. okay here it comes but it's not on play yet I'm going to press yes. play now yes Perfect. yeah exactly all right now I've got you guys over here you look very pretty but I don't really need you so uh, <laughs> can I just get rid of you somehow. <laughs> little boxes that are impeding my ability to read what I have here. You go up to view and get your speaker. It, it's it's the button the all the way on the left. It should be like a little dash that says hide thumbnail video. Yeah, I don't see that. that. It should be at the top of the box with all the, all the webcams. I can't remember. I've got this. this uh... Or you okay. can just like drag it off the screen. Oh, I can drag it off the screen? Yeah, just oh, wait, it, I can like minimize it too. I'll yeah, minimize the, it. Yeah, minimize there we go. It. That's what I was talking about. Okay. Okay. All right. I think I'm set, right? Okay. So I'm gonna go really fast. So it because uh well there's I want to get from where I started to the synthetic biology. That's sort of the, the area I'm gonna go through just to show you a few pictures that'll make it more real, because I don't know the level of understanding that all of you have. So, um, all right. Uh, so because this is geoengineered or as Clifford calls it, uh, geo bioengineered synthetic biology, um, 
uh, we're going to uh, let me see how that went through that. So geoengineering uh, is the intentional manipulation of global scale Earth systems. Fifth generation warfare, which fits with this, as I hope to prove, uh, is a warfare conducted primarily through non-kinetic military actions, such as social engineering, misinformation, cyber attacks, and emerging artificial intelligence, smart technologies. Mm -hmm. I wanted you to know about this. A lot of people don't know about it. It's very important. Um, miso, which is, it doesn't mean the soup, uh, this is the revision of the uh, smith Munt Act of 1948, done by the then President Obama in 2012, basically mm -hmm. has changed uh, what we used to call PSYOP military operations into what they now call MISO, Military Information and Support and Operations. Uh, and this this basically at the bottom you'll see gives the military industrial intelligence complex the legal right to lie and propagate domestic propaganda. And that's important to know that you know when you're reading things or you're learning things or you're listening to people who may or may not know uh, that there are lies uh, in the uh, subject of geoengineering. It's important for us to know that because we're all learning given how much this mm -hmm. has been hidden. Okay. Um, these are the seven operations that Clifford Carnicum presented in 2005 in his, in his excellent, still excellent, still salient film, uh, Aerosol Crimes. And um, let me just go through those. So first of all is the weather engineering, and um, I boldly come forward and say that uh, given the artificial intelligence relationship uh, between the geoengineering that's going on and uh, and the weather, and this is weather, not climate I'm talking about here, uh, all the weather is basically controlled. And it comes off the South Pacific, uh, one of my favorite mental oh, pictures is. Huh? Do you want to create the weather? Huh? Alfred, I um, Alfred, could you mute your mic um, unless you have a question later? Thanks, Jim. So uh, the weather engineering sort of, if you want to just follow it, but let's just do a, a mental picture. This is not always how it is done, but this is my favorite way of, of getting a handle on what we're talking about is there are there is weather real weather arising in the south pacific and um this is mother nature weather and uh and it is quickly uh taken up by in, in my opinion the u.s navy uh merchant marine uh and uh, and other other players uh as uh, as something that they want to take north uh, all the way up the coast, about 200 miles off the coast. And um, they use lasers. They, uh, they drag it beyond California, which as you know, has been in, basically in drought, even though it is getting rain from time to time. What is happening with the rain because of the aluminum oxide that has fallen uh, on us for, uh, over two decades uh, in the particulates that are coming down from the sky, um, it, it, it makes it, uh, it clogs it up. And so you can get floods very easily there because it's not, the water is not simply not absorbed uh, because of the uh, aluminum oxide. It, and this, this is something that we have seen also, uh, but you didn't recognize it because no one directed your attention to it in the California fires is they have a, a aluminum oxide pounded deeply into the soil. Uh, biologists have said that it's probably at least six inches of aluminum oxide uh, at the top uh, in the topsoil. So so they drag the weather up past California, past Oregon. Oregon too has has had some drought. And uh, and above me, I'm in the Pacific Northwest, 
uh, north of me and uh, in British Columbia, where you all are, uh, is the uh, the uh, over overarching uh, jet stream uh, is sort of parked over Vancouver Island. And cost you. And uh, yes, and that that also, and so you have a loop there that then can they can they can actually put the weather uh, on the loop. Uh, on the jet stream and take it east uh, again by means of electromagnetic uh, energy, uh, and they can create weather for the uh, the main the mainland United States. Uh, that could be mean drought in Kansas. That could be a that could also be a tornado in Kansas. Uh, it could be anything that they want. Like we just went through the polar vortex. Uh, seen one more time, uh, as described excellently by uh, uh, the the chemtrails. Um, what is his name? Uh, the and we see how uh, and, and Pacific I know Jim, Redwood. No, not Pacific Redwood. No, it's the chemtrail. I'm sorry, I'm blocking his name. It's just a, a moniker. I don't know who he really is. He's always been very private. Um, Weather World he, 101? No, I'll send it to you, though, because okay. uh, I think it's the best thing out on, on the how the polar vortex is created. So uh, so they take the weather east, and, uh, and, and that's kind of how that happens. The weather is always moving west to east, unless it's forced to go east to west, as so, it happened in the California fires, by the way, uh, making wind rise up. Uh, and blow west uh, it was very unusual, very very telling as to what was going on. So that's that. Yeah, now, down to the chemical, chemical electromagnetic. Uh, that's a lot of experiments going on in the uh, atmosphere now that it has been properly ionized, and that is primarily done, uh, as I'll show in a few minutes, uh, through the um, the heart. Uh, capabilities and the uh, the domination. Suzanne, now, your mic is unmuted, and we can hear you. And the domination of uh, of the uh, ionosphere, uh, and and to some extent the magnetosphere as well. Uh, they can now perform uh, many many types of. And I think one of my favorite things that's being done a lot in our atmosphere is plasma. There is a there are a lot of plasma experiments going on, and uh, and we we of course don't know much about plasma, uh, and, and there are all sorts of um, untruths in what is taught, in my opinion, uh, what is taught in uh, engineering schools. So uh, that's very important uh, that that is going on. That's one of the special operations of geoengineers. The third one is planetary geophysical operations. And in that, I would have to include the California fires, the Maui fire, et cetera. I would have to do that. And I, you know, I would lay out my story as to how that is being done and why, why exactly it is geoengineered. Uh, but it has to do with planetary geophysical operations. Then there's the directed energy warfare operations. And that was a bit sticky because up till now, we've thought of, uh, you know, like missiles are, uh, our directed energy and things you can see. Uh, now we have energy that can be directed in a variety of ways and uh, and also energy systems on the earth and above us uh, in the atmosphere, for example, satellites, uh, which can be drawn upon for targeting uh, with directed energy. So it's, it's more complex now. Uh, and then the fifth operation is the surveillance neural operations. That neural operations to me means mind control, but it also means uh, simply the ability to run the human beings on the earth. And that is definitely what is being set up right now. Uh, and, uh, and they have that technology uh, in spades. And that's pretty much what I'm writing about now. Uh, then the sixth operation is the biological transhumanism operations. I'm also writing about that. The shift from uh, from molecular biology to digital biology, the shift from natural biology to synthetic 
artificial biology. Uh, and uh, this is tremendously important because it will lead us directly into transhumanism. And most of us do not realize it has already begun. And we all are subject to it because of the epigenetic uh, approach they took through the environment with geoengineering. It, it's highly, highly uh, important to understand the relationship between that that has been going on now for, well, for many years, I, if I want to include everything. But this operation that I spent three, four, now four books, I'll be done with the fourth very shortly. Uh, these four books all talk about the Project Cloverleaf uh, and, um, and, and how far it has gone uh, with all these other disciplines, uh, electromagnetics, uh, it, you know, electrical engineers, uh, IEEE, uh, uh, you know, all, all of it. It's uh, in the biological, the uh, big pharma, the big medicine. Uh, all of these things now are in, are coordinating together for the birth of and, uh, and running of the transhumanism. So uh, then the seventh one is detection obscuration of exotic propulsion systems. This one's really interesting because, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of, uh, People say, well, there are UFOs, there aren't UFOs. Uh, and um, really, to me, I, I, I never feel I have to go off planet in order to uh, bring that subject into its proper perspective, because uh, we, have, uh, we have been working to build exotic propulsion systems. And we have done a great deal with that, but we have kept most of it secret because, of course, it's weaponry. So um, that's enough of that. I'll be moving on here. Let's see. Okay, there's the famous HARP, uh, acres of phased array antenna. The phased array antenna is the name of the game now. You've got one if you won't own a cell phone. I don't own a cell phone, never will. Uh, and um, that is... Uh, that is tremendous for turning for what is called dual use. You've got it on one hand, it's uh, it's very convenient. It's a, builds a fantastic product. You can, you can go a long way with the uh, radio waves and microwaves, et cetera. But, uh, but again, uh, the other hand, it is a weapon system. And I am, and there is no doubt in my mind, but that HARP is a, uh, one of the ionosphere keters in the world. We've got lots of them now. Uh, and it is a very, very potent we weapon system. And I think you saw it. Uh, I agree with Judy Wood. She never said it was HARP uh, because it wasn't just HARP, but it was uh, it was definitely uh, there on 9-11. Uh, and, uh, and that is a great book. If you don't have it yet, where did the towers go? I highly recommend you get it. Okay, there is Nick's and Jean Manning's book, uh, Angels Don't Play This Heart. It was when I was reading that book that I had my first visit from a military chopper over my house here in Olympia uh, that spent about five minutes uh, intimidating me, I guess, or maybe putting my XY coordinates down. I don't know. Uh, but it was because I'd been reading this book that uh, I, I deserved a visit from the military uh, it was the only visit I'm aware of having uh, deserved. And then here's Rosalie Bertel, fantastic woman, uh, scholar, nun, uh, an epidemiologist uh, who wrote uh, Planet Earth, The Latest Weapon of War, a critical study. She um, She's dead now, but my God, she put together uh, the lion's share of just about everything I know. Uh, other than the synthetic biology move. The ability of the HARP space lab rocket combination to deliver very large amounts of energy comparable to a nuclear bomb anywhere on Earth by a laser and particle beams is frightening. Yes, it's very true. And then this is, I want to show this because there's a lot of argument about the disposition of HARP. Oh, there is no HARP anymore. I actually read that still. Uh, and um, there was a time by the, by 2015 uh, when um, they had come to terms with the University of Alaska at Fairbanks to take over HARP 
but that's that's only because our universities are all pretty much whores uh, who have gotten into bed with the military. And um, they do all sorts of things for the military, but that does not mean that they are in charge. This morning, very interesting. I wanted to ask uh, a question, a couple of questions here about HARP, the High Frequency Active Aurora Research Program. Uh, several of you at the table have a little bit of a piece here. Do you know this is located up in Alaska? It's currently funded by the Air Force Research Lab. It was formerly funded by the Office of Naval Research. One of the prime customers is DARPA, uh, which is currently running experiments at the facilities there. So uh, questions to, to several of you this morning. I'm told by the president of the University of Alaska that the Air Force has pulled its support for the facility and they're taking steps to, uh, to demolish it or take it down uh, this summer. He's making the argument that, uh, that there is other opportunities for us and uh, is trying to find a path where the university might be able to take title to the facility. I, I, I'd like to start with you, Dr. Pradhakar. I understand that um, a lot of folks here on the committee probably don't understand what HARP does. I think most Alaskans don't really know what HARP does or why the agency is involved in it. Uh, so a very brief explanation and then a more direct question, would you be disappointed or would you lose something if, if HARP were to go away? Uh, Senator Markowski, as, as I think you know, uh, one of our programs has been using the HARP facility for the research that, that uh, it's pursuing. Uh, and my understanding is that we did get value out of that interaction. Um, but the P in DARPA is projects, and uh, we're not in the business of doing the same thing forever. So very naturally, as we conclude that work, uh, we're going to move on to other topics. So I, it's not a, it's not a uh, an ongoing need uh, for DARPA, despite the fact that we had actually gotten some good value out of the, the, that infrastructure in the past. Understood. Then. To, to uh, Dr. Walker and, and Mr. Schaefer, then, it, Dr. Walker, your agency is currently running the facility. Um, uh, I've mentioned that it's our understanding through the president of the UAF that, that plans are to move forward and, and demolish the facility this summer. So the question to you is, is that accurate? Can you explain why? And then uh, perhaps to both you and Mr. Schaefer, is there any benefit in exploring a potential relationship with the University uh, of Alaska to, to perhaps take over the Harvard? Thank you, Senator. The Air Force has uh, gotten great value out of Harvard in the past few years. We developed the Navy and managed it, and they did a number of uh, experiments and things up there. We have finished our, our work that we are interested in doing up there. We've, uh, Moving on to other ways of uh, managing the ionosphere, which the HARP is really designed to do, is to inject energy into the ionosphere and be able to actually control it. And that, that work is, has been completed. Uh, the Air Force. Uh... So that's the part I wanted you to hear. Uh, we do, the US Air Force has control over the ionosphere. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, the ionosphere is, starts at about, uh, I think, 25 miles up and goes all the way to the magnetosphere, which goes far, far out into space. Um, and so uh, we, we really get our, our ionization uh, out of the ionosphere and we utilize it for weather, we use, utilize it for those experiments I just ran through that are, are happening. Uh, so it's invaluable and uh, its ability to, as a weapon, uh, as part of the weapon arsenal of the ionosphere keters in general in the northern latitudes is tremendous because you can bounce off and and the fellow who talks about this the most uh worked for the uh, royal navy uh, of uk and that would be barry trower t-r-o-w-e-r a brilliant uh guy who was trained by the uh, royal navy uh, in electromagnetics. He understands exactly how uh, to have the ionosphere where you can bounce signals off of the ionosphere and send them to any 
coordinates that you may want that to be the target area, it's tremendous. And uh, and and is uh, is what uh, we just uh, heard uh, regarding the ability of HARP with uh, with various other instruments of the system, uh, how it can be uh, much more powerful than a nuclear bomb. So um, so I just wanted you to hear that it's it's still going on, it's still active, it's still being used, uh, and uh, maybe University of Alaska is involved, but so is the military. Um, All right. But, there's... But before we go any further, could I jump in real quick, Alan? On yeah, that? yeah. Go ahead, Jim. Um, so I don't talk about this a lot, but um, Dr. Chris Fallen um, became the director of HARP at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Um, we had many interactions on Twitter before we became closer friends and then graduated to having cell phone conversations. Um, I put together a PowerPoint presentation on how HARP works and all the things it does. And because he is the director of it and teaches on it, I sent it to him for him to grade it. He came back with, I agree with everything you said there, except the last two pages. And of course the last two pages were about, the Fukushima Daiichi <laughs> nuclear meltdown and the 9.0 earthquake that happened while they were creating, they, TM, were creating um, a 2.5 hertz uh, ultra low frequency wave. Um, when Chris left the University of Alaska Fairbanks, um, he told me a couple things that were previously unknown to the public. I shared this with, um, with um, Nick Begich via a Zoom call. That, that because of Gene Manning and Nick's book, they actually named the six engines that run, the diesel engines that power the ionospheric research instrument, the actual antennas at HARP. They named them Angels 1 through 6. Oh, wow. After, after his book. Um, tragically, <laughs> I, I was supposed to do an interview. He, he had agreed to come on, you know, um, and do an interview on my YouTube channel, but then he went to Kirtland Air Force Base. And I don't need to explain anything to Alana about that. Yep. Yep. So he went to work for the Air Force Research Lab, and it wasn't until he left the Air Force Research Lab that he was being, and even while he was there, he was telling me a lot of stuff about ionospheric heaters on satellites, um, you know, the, ca the current capabilities of the heart facility, only three quarters of the array is actually operational right now. Um, there's a whole lot more I could say about that, but I just wanted to summarize with this. Mm -hmm. Chris Fallen, after he made it out of the AFRL, started to work with me on a project to track ionospheric modification using things other than ionospheric heaters. Mm -hmm. And we we were going through my map, we were working on things like high powered FM radios and missile defense radars and things like that, that were acting as ionospheric heaters. And then I got an email and we, we had a three hour conversation at Christmas time. And I got an email about a month ago from a friend with Chris Fallen's obituary. And he died at the age of 46 years old. I'm 47. He was yeah. perfectly healthy and happy in December and yeah. gone in an instant. Yeah. Very interesting timing. The The thing that's interesting about the video, and I can confirm this from my own research from, you know, and I too worked from Rosalie Bertel's work up till, you know, my own education to verifying it, you know, a lot of it with Chris, um, that when John Hexer was saying we've moved on to other ways to manage the ionosphere, mm -hmm. specifically, they were talking about how they used polar electrojet heating to create ultra low frequencies. They were heating the auroral electrojet, okay. and that's why it was located on a magnetic field line. They were able to shoot electricity directly into it and tune the earth into a virtual antenna yeah but then they had a breakthrough and they came up with a new way to do it 
and this is called ionosphere current drive. And because they did, they 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 found this new way of heating the ionosphere that no longer required being at the North Pole, they can do it anywhere in the world. So they wow. they can put it in specifically Dennis Papadopoulos from the University of Maryland did an entire presentation on this. Um, and he called it the straw man. You can't make this up straw man, high frequent, high frequency array where they would put an, a mobile ionospheric heater on a barge so that yeah. they could move it anywhere in the world at any time. Um, yeah. and that's where the current technology is. It's in space. It's behind Jeeps. Um, like Mirage, the microwave ionospheric reconfiguration and ground-based emitter. Um, it's on boats so that they, it's because of the strategic importance of the space fence and mm -hmm. being able to control the ionosphere, they don't want our adversaries knowing the exact location of Harp and Gakona, Alaska, because it'll be the first thing they take out with a missile. So it, it's only logical that they would move on to other ways to manage the ionosphere by making yeah. them mobile. Very good. Very good. Thanks for that, Jim. Gosh. Very good. All right. So here's um, Billy Hayes. Uh, I owe him a debt for the second book, Under an Ionized Sky, From Chemtrails to Space Fence Lockdown. Billy was very helpful to explain how the space fence was set up primarily uh, through Lockheed Martin's patents that it controls. And uh, uh, and Billy uh, was uh, just invaluable to me. Uh, he was an MK Ultra survivor from childhood. He was run by the CIA his entire life. Uh, we became quite close in the sense of over the internet. I never met Billy in the flesh. But we would go on lots of, uh, we did, I don't know, maybe a dozen or more radio interviews, the two of us. Uh, and it got to where I could not continue with him because uh, he would be given a, a, um, a grand mal seizure as soon as the interview started. Uh, and I felt that he was going to die on the air and, um, and I would never forgive myself. So, so I stopped doing those and uh, Billy, of course, did not like that. He was very attached to me. He's a lovely person. Uh, just never really had his own life, you know. That's that's the way it tends to go. So I thank Billy. Okay, that's backwards. Okay. I need to go forward. Okay, another loss. Michael Murphy. Uh, he did the uh, the two films. Uh, he directed one, and he uh, was involved in the other. Under uh, why in the world are they spraying? Uh, what in the world are they spraying was the first one. And then why in the world are they spraying? And then he was working on the third film uh, when uh, he fell and collapsed into uh, drug addiction, homelessness, targeting, uh, everything you could possibly think of, which prevented the, the film was two thirds done and never was finished by him. But the two thirds that is completed, uh, other than the fact that, that a lot of the people in it are not uh, named, uh, is out and about, uh, thanks to some activists who found a copy. So um, Michael died in Chicago a couple of years ago. Uh, and, um, you know, I feel he was killed in order to prevent the completion of the third film. Uh, and I'll stop there because there there is more I know, but that's enough. Um, okay, then this is kind of how the what is called interferometry uh, as a weapon system. This is what HARP can do. Think of those two beams coming from those two ionosphere heaters in the northern latitudes. Uh, going over the target area and uh, and to where when the beams cross, then you have the uh, the the real juice in the in what is crossing over each other. I uh, I had a funny thing happen in Santa Fe when I lived there. I was at the uh, uh, it's wonderful cowgirls bar that I loved down in old Santa Fe, 
and uh, having a beer and talking to people. Uh, and uh, the guy sitting two away from me, uh, turned out he worked at Los Alamos uh, Labs, uh, which is right outside Santa Fe. And uh, and I said, well, gosh, it's so great to meet you. I, I have a burning question. If, if you could answer it, I'd really be happy. What, what exactly is interferometry? <laughs> and he picked his beer up. He went to the very end of the bar. I took that as a, I can't talk about that. <laughs> so uh, here it is. This would be what it can do. This would be what happened at 9-11 if, if indeed uh, we're right about the exotic weapon used there, not just interior uh, detonations, which also would have accompanied it just as a safeguard. Um, so that, okay. There's the jet stream for those who don't know, a jet stream, uh, big sneaky thing going straight across. Uh, well, not straight. And then we all know this, there's nothing to see here. I just wanted to show that it's not just the coming out of the combustion chambers. There's generally multiple trails coming out. Uh, and uh, that's, those are the, the chemical trail. And then here is the sounding rocket launches, uh, which leave an amazing uh, chemical signature, which people think, oh, such a pretty sunset. Uh, rocket launch delivering lithium. Lithium tends to be white, sort of an opal looking white over a dense population. Again, these, these are generally done over populations. Uh, okay, rocket exhaust is a dusty plasma. There are certain models for smart dust. The smart dust is very much a nanotechnology created by the human being. Uh, uh, but the uh, you know dusty plasma, we are, we're very familiar with that. Uh, and then here we have some plasma. I mentioned how there's experiments going on and you'll see here this part. Um, my guess is um, someone's on a laptop somewhere and they're moving the uh, plasma clouds around and maybe maybe bringing them all together so that there's a great deal of plasma and then moving it uh, in a variety of ways. Uh, maybe fun and games, uh, maybe a serious uh, exercise, but that is plasma. And the clouds above you are plasma as a rule, all right? Uh, here we see, uh, again, you know this, uh, if you're putting out frequency, uh, it'll have a pulse to it. Uh, and the, we, set, we see these before earthquakes. Uh, we, we see uh, a, a very serrations in the sky. This, this. No, no, that. Oh. Uh, Jack Cruz. A uh, heart surgeon always has a very terse comment for things. Uh, he who controls the electromagnetic spectrum on Earth controls the living things on the surface of the planet. Uh, this I'm just going to show. Scientists discovered a human made barrier around Earth protecting against the natural particle radiation in space. They believe the bubble was formed by very low frequency waves, or VLFs. VLFs have been found to interact with the particles in space, affecting how and where they move. VLFs are used for radio communications, including with submarines, because they can penetrate deep into the ocean. The waves can also travel far into the environment around Earth. By understanding more about how VLF transmissions so uh, I like this little video so far. It's the only thing I see that uh, sort of explains at least the top layer of the space fence. Uh, that is this uh, ring around the planet that is being made uh, with uh, metal particulates and, and I assume other, other things. Uh, and this makes it sound like, whoa, we just discovered this. It, I have no idea how it was formed up there, but it's really cool because you know we can do this and that. So uh, this is uh, very very important to think of the space fence, which I think you probably call the smart grid. Uh, 
it, it's it's on top of us. It's sandwiching us between. We have the infrastructure that's explained uh, very uh, thoroughly in the second book, Under an Eye Nice Sky. And then, uh, and then you have the top layer, which uh, heretofore did not have, uh, I don't know how many thousands of satellites are up there now, but we have a lot of, especially CubeSats, a lot of CubeSats are up there uh, from Elon Musk and others. There, there are, you know, Google has its satellites up there. The military has its satellites up there. It's really crowded up there. So, uh, but we're right between, we live between uh, the, uh, all the things that are, are part of it, uh, part of the space fence on the earth. And they are all uh, basically um, calibrated together. That's that's the key, is the calibration is, is very centralized, is very controlled. And that's what makes it so that I can, I can honestly say to you that we are all plugged into it. Uh, no matter uh, how careful we are, no matter how uh, uh, in the rural areas we live, we are all plugged into it. Uh, uh, again, I remind you of this very thin little bit of the uh, uh, of of how much we can see, how much we can experience uh, of the full electromagnetic spectrum. We we you know, and you look at that and go, "Wow, why would why would we have been made this way? Why weren't we made so that?" Uh, we could have more input from the full spectrum going all the way from from megahertz from uh, microwaves to uh, the gamma rays. Uh, well, it's just the way it is. The, the our senses are right there, and that's why we use instruments. And those who control the instruments, which are generally very expensive, uh, have so much power. That's just the way it goes. Um, here I again more on that. Let's keep going. Uh, these this was the old system, the nano bio info cogno. Uh, they use this and there. And here's uh, and then Julian. And so if, if you switch those together, you can effectively triangulate someone's um, activities and behavior. And I don't think by stopping out uh, you know, or adding. Uh, Kind of stuff, other you can make that much of a difference. And increasingly, increasingly it's less. And the, in terms of the internet thing, there's research prototypes now, which I assume are being used by a very small electronic circuit um, that you can just put in paper or put paper on it. On the wall uh, that are powered by the GSM space. And so they operate as you can hear some radio waves passing through them, which is not, not powerful, a very small amount of time. Yeah, obviously, that chemistry is going to be continued. You know, they like the insulated thing is that it's, uh, if you like, uh, intelligent evil dust uh, scattered anywhere, like, like some techies, you know, everything. Uh, I yeah, I wanted you to hear that, that intelligent evil dust, because that is basically the dust in your homes that you may dust uh, the shelves or something. Uh, and you'll notice that the dust of today is very different from the dust of yesterday. So uh, so let's be uh, aware of that we're surrounded by and breathing in smart dust at every turn. And so are our children. Uh, what is this? This is the, what I told you about the fires and about is this. The, um, the is that the one that this is Jamie Lee, who just died after two years of being heavily targeted electromagnetically. He's talking with a nanotechnology uh, PhD retired. And you can see that there's multiple uh, deployments of different aspects that were used. I mean, so what I would say, every fire that's been been since probably 2017 or 2015, um, and they all have the same signature all the way up until now. I I think I'd like to think that the hand was a little over the place uh, with this last fire, and uh, I really would like to thank people who will wake up from this. And it's, it's, it's truly just is a 
attack and it's not anything else but that. Um, but they're both sort of huge post. So there's a huge problem with that because now you have on the other side, um, you know, the programming with that blue light, whether it's the on switch to the particular bot, it also uh, can be programmed against the lines to, to have people just completely disregard what's going on. And, uh, and that's a scary thought because uh, it, 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 if you look at the way the light works with the eye and, and, and even the Wi-Fi itself, it's so easy to program the light. It will make you feel so and think a specific way with the right technology. Yeah, and the Wi-Fi, so people know, is a two-way communication device. They use the computing rate of the, of the light that's going on and off at a very high intensity to program you or read anything in your home. I mean, this is Alexa on steroids. I mean, uh, every LED light is, is a Wi Fi machine that's recording, uh, uh, adjusting frequency modulations. I mean, and how many people have LEDs? How many stores have LEDs? Everybody, right? Yeah, that's right. And so, I, even industry, I, I, I have been around years ago when, when I was now manufacturing the, the very small factory chambers at the time. They were growing these um uh controlling uh, uh the actual chip that, that they used to move out of flight of these I would to they polarize them or there's been a uh uh electric in the blue if you want to call it you know like you can see so uh through the light of any diode in one direction and the transmit like that less frequency you gain depending on what uh and then now, if you turn that around and you receive it, you, you emit light, it will actually enter that uh, light emitting diode. It will actually produce electricity. So uh, there's none of that gain. So you can you can literally transmit that energy, light being across, and we're collecting reflected through the atmosphere or anywhere you want. And have it, let's say you spend one watt downstream. You're going to receive one watt downstream. So there's no loss. Uh, you say that there's no, no loss. loss. There's no loss of uh, whatever you're transferring, right? Absolutely not. There, there's no loss. There's no there's no resistance. Um, and it is instant. And that's what makes it so. So the human, the human body is so susceptible to it. You can't see it. You, you don't recognize it in, in the reality that you're in. Um, and, and it's so, and it's so, it's so easily. Um, just notice, even though it's right in front of your face, when you see the forming embers that uh, that people think that that's, that's fire, it's not. It's it's literally it's still right over there, right? So here, here are these right. quote Arthur C. Clarke and Isaac Asimov and Arthur C. Clarke are talking about the sci-fi writers. Arthur C. Clarke helps help uh, give the vision to NASA. Well, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, and it says right here, this is from engineering.com. Programmable matter is essentially what it sounds like. Matter that can change its physical properties, such as its shape and optical characteristics based on a user's input. This definition ranges from something as simple as liquid crystals, which we're talking about, which can be altered by the application of an electric field to something as sci fi as the shape shifting liquid metal T1000 from the Terminator franchise. And they have modular robotics, they have all these different types, um, metamaterials, um, all these different types of platronics, um, promise of programmable matter going. Through. Okay, so that's enough of that. Uh, what you were looking at as, as all these sparks uh, running along the road in groups, in clusters, uh, as if they were heading somewhere or as if the wind was blowing. First of all, there was no wind that day, no wind whatsoever. Uh, Jamie was there. He makes it very clear there was no wind. So those are not embers being blown about. Those are nanotechnology under programming to go and start fires in one place and skip the next house and go to the next house etc. That's what that was. And that was confirmed by this nanomaterials uh, PhD who remained anonymous. I talked to him for two hours on the phone. Uh, I never got his name. 
Okay, so, all right. So then now we're the biology from molecular biology to digital biology. This is what we're engaging in now. The idea that, for example, the most famous example, perhaps, uh, that uh, the uh, coronavirus has never been isolated. Uh, uh, and what that is, is no, it hasn't. What, uh, what they use now is not molecular bio biological entities other than probably to take a, 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 um, a bacteria, bacteria are used a lot, and uh, turn it into a vector for some other operation, uh, et cetera. Believe it or not, if you have the frequency, uh, you can just use the frequency and transmit it electromagnetically and make somebody sick. That's how it's working. It's not a matter of contagion. It really never was. Uh, and the book that goes into that and, and sort of gives the clue to that is Arthur Furstenberg's uh, the, uh, the Invisible Rainbow, uh, A History of, Electri uh, of Electronics or of uh, Electricity. And, and you see that transmission of frequency, as Tesla tried to tell us, uh, leads to everything. Uh, and so you don't really need biology uh, because the, well, I don't want to get into the virus. Uh, I will be writing a book on synthetic biology after I finish this fourth geo uh, engineering book for the publisher Inner Traditions. So um, what has happened is that genetics has become a branch of information technology. It is pure information. It's digital information. It's precisely the kind of information that can be translated digit for digit, byte for byte into any other kind of information and translated back again. This is a major revolution. I suppose it's probably the major revolution in the whole history of our understanding ourselves. And this is what we have to deal with now because we're still being uh, allowed to uh, think that the old medical assumptions were true when they weren't. Uh, and that's why I'm writing the uh, synthetic biology book. Okay, as above, so below, Hermes Trismegistus. Um, and here's some fibers that are coming down from the sky. These are environmental fibers. And much the same is in our bodies and has been found. Uh, here we have uh, some fibers. 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 This is the kind that uh, I began to see in Morgellons sufferers. Jan Smith was a wonderful woman. Uh, she had Morgellons very badly and um, she died of it. Uh, this is from Harry Rhodes, who is uh, a UK uh, activist, very active in um, studying uh, free energy systems. So here he's looking at a sore that has pretty much everything that looks kind of like a, uh, a circuit board. And um, boy, that's that's spot on. Um, okay, then um, these are all uh, tiny uh, sensors. The sensors are very important. Here's more nanotechnology, quantum dots. Uh, these are being found a lot in the live blood analysis uh, uh, by the people with the powerful uh, dark field microscopes. Uh, here's another example, a complementary metal oxide semiconductor in the blood. Synthetic organisms and living machine don't need to do that. Uh, there's Tony. I have something from Tony. How the fibers, filaments, biofilm initiate self-assembly. Tony spends a lot of time on that. I'm very grateful to him for that. Uh, here he is, uh, carbon nanotube. He blazed out, because he had Morgellons very bad. He studied uh, how to make people better on his own body. Uh, okay. Uh, here's David Nixon today. 
uh, taking dark field uh, amazing photographs. There will be some in the uh, synthetic biology book. David is a very lovely person, very dedicated. And this was the first bit of computer hardware at a nano scale that really caught my attention because it's all right angles. It looks, again, we've got the circuit board kind of thing. Uh, and this is what the, uh, the C19 shots were filled with. So it seems to me that people were being uploaded with computer parts at a nanoscale and probably the software as well. This is in our blood, not just in a few people. We're talking, we're talking a lot of people. Uh, I, I didn't I didn't have the uh, I think I'm at the end. Yeah, I am at the end. So um, that's how many I just kind of pulled really kind of rapidly so that, um, you know, <laughs> I could show you all that. Uh, all right. So now I'll bring you all back if I can find you here. There's me. There's you. OK, so and uh, stop share. OK. Awesome. Wow. <laughs> oh, that wasn't that was amazing. Thank you, Alana, so much. So if there's anybody with questions, please raise your hands so then we can just uh, have you have you guys ask questions. Is there anybody that would like to ask some question? I'm I'm still overwhelmed, so I I won't right now. <laughs> um, but anyway, before we get into this, Alana, would you mind uh, that I quickly get uh, Paula here? And because obviously we've got to celebrate something. She sent me a text on Sunday and she said, we just won the Platinum Award for Best Documentary, Short Best Female Director, Gold and Best Editing, Silver at the Los Angeles Independent Short Awards. Congratulations. Wow. <laughs> That's great. Hey, Jim. <laughs> Good job, Paula. Hey, you're on the front front line there, Mr. Mister. Um, yes. And uh, we just ended up getting another five awards to the Indie uh, Short Fest and uh, ended up Canada Short Awards. We ended up uh, getting a, a award of accommodation and was the impact uh, film of the year at the Ethos um uh, uh, film awards, which is a purpose-driven film festival. It's vitally important that all the work, um, and I have, I've never, never had a chance to meet you, Alana, but, uh, I've been working on this for about 27 years and, wow. uh, yeah. <laughs> and Paula, if it makes you feel any better, I've talked to Alana on the phone at least 40 times and sometimes two hours in a conversation and we've never actually been in a room together like this. <laughs> That's why I had to be here tonight. <laughs> we're all talking heads now. Yeah. You know, it's great because she's saying, you know, we're all coming together. And, you know, I know that uh, Jean is on this somewhere. She's in there. And um, it is now not just all of us that are doing the great work to get this information out to the people uh, of the planet but it is also being there for each other. And as uh, we're gonna be on the front line in our own realms of support, we need to now stretch it out through the, that, that ripple in the, the pond. Uh, as it starts to spread, uh, we are going to make the difference that has to be for our planet. And um, I, I thank you, Patina, very, very sweet. Um, acknowledgement there. It is just the beginning. Uh, it looks like we're going to be in Cannes, France. They're going to be shopping it uh, next week in Cannes. And that's just the short. It's a 40 minute short. We just finished it. Uh, the wonderful Peter Nanasi uh, award winning composer is just finishing the composition will come in tomorrow. Brand new com com uh, composition, a score uh, that you're going to listen to real soon, you two. And yeah, yeah. it's going to be very exciting. And he Can I just is, say that we're 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 making the best film on this that has ever been made. We need the, we need the feature done. We need the feature. We need all that support. 
Yes, you're right. Jim, Jim is one of my stars in there. Uh, I've known Jim, I think the first time I talked to him was about 2012 before my house burned down from a lightning strike. Yeah. I've had, I've had multiple, uh, floods in different locations. And cancer and oh, carbon okay. monoxide poisoning. And then COVID came along and the film just came to an abrupt halt and, you just keep on you going. Are, you are a freaking trooper, Paula. <laughs> That's all I got to say. We don't have a choice. There is yeah. no choice. Yeah. We have to do what we have to do because we only, as Miss Alana said earlier, for, you know, like, this hasn't been said. So for everybody who does not know, um, Gene Manning, who's here, co-authored the book, Angels Don't Play This Harp. And Paula made the film you probably seen it holes in heaven that was directed by Martin Sheen uh, that was narrated by Martin Sheen. So if you've ever seen that film about the book and about the technology with Martin Sheen talking, that's the Paula Randall Smith that says green wisdom media on the screen. And she initially came to me to make a part two to this film. And I'm going to tell you what it is morphed from a film about harp to a film about the entire spectrum of weather control, geoengineering, space weather modification, everything in between. And the way she's putting it together, my hat's off to you. I am not a filmmaker. I'm a nerd. Okay. <laughs> I'm not a I, I'm a nerd. Alana is an author. Okay. Like <laughs> I, I, I nerd, nerd out on this, you know, and, and she's a nerd. I love um, you, nerds. <laughs> I'm a graphics artist. I'm 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 not, but I'm not that. But yeah, Paula, amazing person who, you know, I watched her film uh 20 years ago, which is insane. And for it to come full circle to where we are today, um, I told Paula, I said, um, you know, I would like to get Alana in on this. I think I told you on the phone about it, Alana, but I'd like yeah, to you get did. you in yeah. on this. Yeah. Um, we're trying to raise the funds to get the film in, you know, in theaters. We're not doing playing with this YouTube crap. I mean, we need the normies to know. Um, so hopefully that's a handful of awards. You could have called me. <laughs> I had, you know, it just happened like two days ago. <laughs> and, I, and I wanted to make sure that, you know, it was real before I ended up giving a call. Actually, you were on my list. I, I've been, uh, I went off to shoot the uh, eclipse yesterday, so I didn't get a chance to. But this is just the beginning. This film is essentially the sequel of Holes in Heaven, but it expanded so much. And a lot of that is because of, of Jim's also research, education educating me about uh, the work with uh, cloud seeding and how the combination of these technologies are really working together as I mean as as you know Alana the uh, the amount of technology that is out there and how it's expanded and how they're combining them together to be more uh, as 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 uh, Nick Baggage says you know it it's better they're they're making it better so to speak better you know? <laughs> Yeah, right. and, As and, the Lorax um, would say, they keep bigger in and bigger in. <laughs> yeah, right, right. This is this is just the first one coming out. We're going to end up having three, four, five. We're just going to continue to do these films. We're going to continue to get people. We need that support, um, and that can go through Patina. If you would like to end up helping Jim and I tell the story along with, um, you know, and, and I'll talk to you, Miss Align, because uh, you know we. We need to, uh, you know, to, to meet and, and, and talk a little bit more about the work and, and the research that you're she, doing. She's going to shove a camera team in your face, just so you know. She's already <laughs> threatened me with one, so. We're coming you, after you. We're coming. You, you're, you're next. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much, Bettina, for acknowledging me. And uh, Jean is on. I'm hoping to get uh, enough I'm raising right now to get uh, over to San Rafael later on this month to interview Jean and... Uh, uh, Beverly Rubick, and we're going to be talking about um, it's the, the new Living Expo in San Rafael. I think on the from the 19th through the 22nd of this month, and we're going to be talking about energy. Um, you know, new new works as far as uh, the the incredible 
um, new technology that is for the betterment of humanity and not for the destruction of humanity. And also uh, Gene and all those that are there that is going to talk about the energy, the, the, the biology of how our, our planet is closely aligned to us as humans and how that all works. So it's, it's going to be very exciting. I'm, I'm hoping to be there. Thank you. Oh, good to meet you. Good to meet you. Thank you. Sorry, I, Joe, for being ahead of the game. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to talk to him later. <laughs> I know. All right. Well, anybody, <laughs> so please go ahead and and ask the questions you might have. It's uh, it's it's amazing. I like I say, I'm I'm totally thrilled that I have this summit happening here <laughs> with all these amazing people. Go ahead. <laughs> So Al Alana and I have had these conversations in private. Might as well have them in public, right? I don't know. Um, what are you going to tell? <laughs> <laughs> um, many people, you know, they 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 see what I'm talking about, you know, and they go, oh, Jim Lee just believes it's all jet fuel. And I keep trying to differentiate for the public between what is natural and how to tell the difference. And I think that that's the, the biggest part of the, the C word that really gets everybody screwed up. Um, you know, when we're talking about secret military government DARPA funded projects, you know, we could talk about anywhere from 10 to a thousand planes. Would, when you're talking about nanotechnology, um, especially like smart dust, any of these types of biological warfare. Um, hell, when I was talking to Dr. Rangasai Halthori, I made the point to him, you're the FAA and you make rules about what goes in the jet fuel. But if some dude in Russia decided to put, uh, put let's say, three gallons of cesium-137 in a jet, they could literally irradiate everything along the way and you'd never even know and in fact our government's so crappy at their job they'd pull a fukushima and just turn the radiation detect detection network off and not tell a soul when you're talking about nanotechnology there are only a handful of instruments on the planet that can even see these things so how is it, you know, that we have an aerosol robotic network, we have an EPA air quality detection network, which literally doesn't even sample the chemicals in the air, doesn't sample any biological material in the air. It is literally a wet filter that collects a bunch of material and they weigh it. And that's called science today. We are grossly unprepared and unprotected from any of these technologies, whether it be just pollution from airlines and, you know, to the tune of 13 million barrels of jet fuel per day filled with cancer causing chemicals, which are building up nanoparticles of metal in the sky um, to, you know, what Alana focuses on, you know, everybody has, you know, their focus and what Alana's focusing on is, you know, what I allude to all the time, during the 1950s through the 1970s, the Manhattan-Rochester Coalition, basically the U.S. Army uh, Chemical Corps was spraying zinc cadmium sulfide from coast to coast, Operation Large Area Coverage, among others. Um, these secret government sprayings were for the purpose of simulating nuclear fallout in cities. They called it aerosol behavior of, you know, blah, blah, blah. This secret government program that happened in the 1950s through the 1970s was not made public until 2008, and that was the first mention of it. So while I, you know, I fully acknowledge that, you know, everything Alana's talking about is rooted in reality and is more than likely happening, you know, there's evidence been collected. People need to recognize that there are certain things that we can do, you know, as individuals to protect ourselves, do everything you can to build your immune system, um, deal with electricity. You know, if, you, if you're not dealing with ambient EMR, um, electro smog, 
you know, getting Y fried, as I like to call it, if you're getting Y fried and you're not earthing or grounding yourself, then you're not taking proper precautions. If you're not, you know, turning your cell phone off at night, if you have one, turn it off at night. There, there's, there's some, you know, practical steps that we can take as individuals to protect ourselves. <laughs> at, at, at least, you know, start in your home, start with your family. If you're not taking these basic steps, then your body is going to easily fail when you're ingesting these other particles. Um, and, and what I would like to say, you know, ab about what I, I, I had notes, bro. I totally just failed at all of that. Uh, <laughs> but, but Alana focuses a lot on the, on the space fence, too. And I think that that's one of the things that, you know, most people don't can't even wrap their head around. Um, and when you have so many conspiracy theories that are, I mean, literally I, just, just with the eclipse yesterday, you know, there was, um, oh, there's an engineered spraying operation that's going to happen all along the eclipse line. Um, you know, it's not even the moon that's going in front of, um, the sign it's, uh, what was it, Zaytu and Baja or something? I don't remember. So, you know, you you may know what I'm talking about. I, I, it, I couldn't even believe it. They were saying there's these two dark body planets. Then I saw a whole series of videos on it was Nibiru. And this is the kind of stuff that makes it almost impossible for us to talk about, you know, these serious threats. Um, when you got Yuval Noah Harari out there running around talking about turning everybody into cyborgs and it's literally coming out of his mouth, um, you cannot just discount that. Um, and again, you know, with, with um, Clifford, Clifford's spent decades collecting this stuff. Um, that was one of the things I was going to mention. You, you had mentioned Lyme disease briefly, and we've had this, this is what... Now I've, my brain has finally came back to me. Um, okay. Yeah, the the Lyme disease connection, uh, you mentioned Fort Detrick, and I had found another um, similar connection um, to Lyme disease and its weaponization. Mm -hmm. And that was from um, Plum Island. Yeah, Plum Island, and, right. Yeah, right. So, at, at Plum Island in 1991, Hurricane Bob took out the power on Plum Island Animal Disease Vector Control Biosafety Lab. Anyway, so when they, yeah, the Montauk monster at Plum Island. Anyway, when Hurricane Bob took out the power, I, I found a Department of Homeland Security, um, let's say, hearing that they were having with individuals that were running the project there. And they found mosquitoes, uh, feeding on petri dishes of blood and fecal matter mixed with biological weapons, weapons grade, you know, everything. So what happened in Wuhan happened here in America in 1991. And that Lyme disease, and it's just my personal opinion, looking at the trends and, you know, the dates and the times and the spreads and the, the, the reports of this, that a weaponized version of Lyme disease escaped that lab during that hurricane and has made its way, especially into deer ticks here in the South. Um, deer ticks, my father has Lyme disease, you know, and I, I'm not going to say anything else about that. Um, but I, I, I met a guy named Jeremy Murphy, who was a Lyme disease, you know, or, um, a Morgellons survivor slash advocate. And he, you know, had basically come to the conclusion, you know, after having the fibers in his body tested by numerous individuals, that they were basically like calcification. So the same thing that your fingernails do naturally, this disease was causing fibers to grow from every part of your body. So your body's like naturally, well, not naturally, your body's producing finger on nail like structures those fibers are just the same, almost identical in nature to the fingernail itself. And it's, it stems from this weaponized version of Lyme disease. So that begs the question, has this also been sprayed aerially? This is one of the questions that I have with Alana all the time. Um, and, you know, 
Whereas I'm more inclined to believe that just like with the Wuhan lab, they let a bug loose and they really don't care, you know, damn the public, you know, it was our, our fun bug and it got out, deal with it, people. And if you talk about it, we'll just say you're a tinfoil hatter. Um, but at the same time, you know, you cannot rule out the fact that Umbrella Corp. I love the video games references. Um, <laughs> I'm going to chat. Um, you can't rule out the fact that if it's happened in the past, it's happening now. It will always happen. Um, our government has always had a bone to pick with the ionosphere. They've tried to destroy it numerous times in the past. They did it with the Westford Needle Project when they dumped 280 million antennas, little needle antennas in space. Copper, copper, yeah. yeah. Iron. Yeah. Iron. They, I mean, they just put their little cross, they're called dipole antennas. They just dumped 280 yeah. million needles in space. Um, yeah. They failed three times to actually get them to deploy, but you can find those still in space today and in our North Pole. Um, they tried to blow up our ionosphere. And they did that with nuclear explosions. This led to the limited test ban treaty after Starfish Prime and Operation Hard Tag Teak and all of these things. The point I'm trying to make is the military hates the ionosphere because it's unpredictable. Because when the solar winds interact with our ionosphere and our signals intelligence and our ability to communicate with submarines and any kind of military instrument on the planet, is disrupted because of this waving ionosphere that's why they want finite control of it they they've talked about replacing the ionosphere one jackass literally said we want to destroy the van allen belts i don't even see why they're necessary <laughs> um, I, I mean you can't make this stuff up so what you're talking about is definitely a real thing and i don't think that people understand the ramifications of the and the hubris of the scientists and the the DOD, you know, three letter agencies and their their um, uh, defense contractors that are just making bucks hand over fist. Damn the um, ramifications for our, our entire biosphere, because what most people don't realize is the Schumann resonance or the heartbeat of our planet is produced by solar winds and the fluctuation of our ionosphere. We're to the point now where we're in such a sea of electromagnetic waves that you cannot detect with the best instruments, the 7.83 Hertz signal of our planet, which and we our have brains, been and our brains of yesterday. Right. Yeah. And, and, and that is necessary. In fact, when the military did a study on deep underground military bases, they realized that people's health deteriorated very rapidly mm -hmm. until they put 7.83 hertz generators yeah. down in those deep underground military yeah. bases. And they realized that if they provided an artificial Schumann resonance, those people were perfectly healthy and lived happily. So right. by destroying that Schumann resonance, they are literally interrupting the biological electromagnetic cycle of life worldwide. Yeah, and, and that's where I want to enter now. Go ahead. Getting into a lecture there, or uh, but uh, I want to say that that's exactly the point at which I come in because one of the biggest parts that makes me write and devote my entire life to this stuff is that I am highly aware of the power that secret societies exercise on this plane of existence. And they have for thousands and thousands of years. So, so I'm not going to go into, you know, talking about that, but I want to say that that's the key. Yes, the military will always have that military mind. And it is the people's job to keep them from basically thinking war, war, war all the time and seeing, seeing the value of weaponizing all of nature is what they're talking about. That's right. But it, uh, it's, it's really that transhuman peace, Jim, that where the pedal comes to the metal 
uh, or the metal to the pill, whatever that is. Uh, that uh, really is the point here. They are they are what they are, and they were what they were before World War II. But now there is something that has built up, which is, uh, you know, yeah, I think Harari is terrific. He's the one who tells us the most. He's <laughs> telling us up. exactly what they're thinking. Exactly. And that's how they are. That's that's the inhuman element in these people, in these secret societies that see that the important thing is not the individual human being at all. It is that the secret society will continue over the next thousand years with uh, the same sort of wet dream that the secret society had before this era. But the transhuman part now is going full thrust. And that's, to me, the major problem here. That's the major problem. Is yes, the weaponizing, that's not new. They, they'll, they'll weaponize their grandmother if they could. So uh, <laughs> the, the idea that uh, they are doing it for what to them is a higher purpose, this synthetic biology thing, it's a higher purpose. They are going to turn the human being into a transhuman that can uh, can be one can make it past the Van Allen belts. Excuse me, mm -hmm. uh, and you know that's a wet dream for sure. So you know the human being is we're going from human 1.0 to human 2.0, and that's that's where I'm coming in with my guns blazing, and that's what the synthetic biology book will go deeply into from a more esoteric vantage point. We can't just use the old thinking to look at this. We've got to have some new thinking. I mean, for a long time, they said that Einstein had said, uh, let's see, I've got it here. We cannot solve our problems with the same thinking that created them. No, Einstein yeah. did not say that, but I don't know what genius did. Uh, it's true. And I want to present a whole new way of thinking about this from another vantage point wherein we're deeply seated in uh, the beauty of our humanity, the beauty of our humanity, the, the goodness of our humanity, the truth of our humanity, uh, and then you know deal with the military from there. Uh, that's that's kind of what I'm uh, I'm doing now through this publisher because inner traditions they're very happy to have a writer who has some spiritual ideas. They're the ones who who produced the uh, the Tao of physics. They're the ones who produced the dancing Luli masters. This is, these are the people, and they, they're the ones who came to me. I didn't go looking for them. They came to me because they know how I write. They know what I'm saying. I am a spiritual being having a material experience here as a human being, and I'm really ticked off about this. I do not want these secret societies uh, running everything uh, because they have no respect for the human being's own evolution, and they will not support it. So, you know, both guns blazing, Jim. On, on that note, I'm going to say something controversial. Um, oh, no, you, not you. No, never. Um, would you say, and it's just, it, this is just a personal opinion, but would you agree that the transgender ideology that's being pushed today coupled with the neural link oh we're doing this to save people with disabilities or you know it's going to be beneficial i see these two ideologies as priming the public for the eventuality which is some freakish version hellish version of cyberpunk 2077 where you know everybody's parts out you know brave new world um type stuff where you know the 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 rich and wealthy the super you know filthy rich they get the upgrades everybody else will be sold on the cheap parts to begin with you'll be augmenting your legs your eyes you'll be able to see like a barn owl oh it's going to be great and until it breaks and then they decide oh you know what um, you're not part of the cool kid kids club. Um, and you know, you won't get the upgrades, but those, you know, in the secret societies, those that are part of the Vanguard group, you know what I mean? Uh, the, the black, yeah. the black rock Vanguard owners, 
um, you know, they'll get all the cool toys that upgrade that don't actually leave you broken down on the side of the road, so to speak. I see this whole, you know, especially with the, the, the pushing of transgender ideology on young children yeah. as indoctrination moving towards a transhuman agenda. Absolutely. Absolutely right. No okay. question about it. And it's, okay. it's everything that'll work. They don't care. They don't care if it's wrong. They don't care if it's evil. They don't care if it's violent. They don't care anything about that because they disparage the human being for pursuing its own evolution in its own time. We are not, our evolution as conscious beings is not subject to these secret societies. Those days are long gone, thank you God, uh, because we ourselves are free will beings. And I wanna put us forward and say to people, don't do what they say just because they make it look cool. Cause you know, it's not gonna be cool. You know how these people are. We've dealt with them for thousands of years. We know they take our children and they rape them. They murder them. They use them for blood sacrifices. These are not the people that we care about. We care about ourselves and our evolution. And we do not want their uh, synthetic biology, bioengineered uh, type of uh, evolving or devolving us. We don't want it. We just don't want it. And we need to really take it seriously. Is that your friend? Can I just quickly jump in? So there is a question here. Troy, I call on you. Troy, come on on. Was that Troy? Yeah, Troy's muted. Yeah. Yeah, Troy. Troy yeah, there we go. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. All right. So a lot, a lot of great information. I got some more books to uh, to read now. I guess. Um, <laughs> Lucky you. Yeah. Hey. Um, so um, I sent you a message, uh, Jim, in the chat there about uh, uh, Lyme disease. I, um, I've been studying plant medicine for a number of years, and um, there's some studies about uh, Japanese knotweed, and um, I don't know if you looked yeah, into it. I did see that. I, I've i got my browser open, so I've already bookmarked it. <laughs> yeah, right. I've got Right now, I've got about 15 tabs open. I've been just <laughs> keep bookmarking. <laughs> I, I'm that nerd. I will go back and read all of this at a later date. All right. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure you I appreciate that, that man. Yeah, and, I saw um, that. And so, and so my question is, um, I've got a talk coming up with uh, one of our uh, federal politicians here in Canada, and um, in I'll, I'll have 15 minutes to talk to him, and I have to try to um, to sell him on the fact that uh, climate change is geoengineering, that uh, we are creating the climate change through geoengineering. And so I'm wondering, um, there's there's so much, and I've only got 15 minutes to talk to him, right? And so I'm trying to uh, to make it as easy as possible for him to digest. I, I'm going to talk about um, all the patents that are that the fact that there's all these patents and that they um, um, Operation Popeye. Um, so there's there's facts that that these things do exist in in the normie world, right? Because I'm dealing with somebody. If I start talking to him about nanoparticles and nano dust and stuff like that, I'm totally going to lose them. And so I'm wondering if, if either one of you guys or anybody on the chat has a silver bullet that I can, that will really hammer it home. And then I, I can use this when I talk to other people as well. And because a lot of people just, they won't look up, they're too busy to look up. And then you try to explain to them what's going on. And they say, well, the news told me that that's just condensation. So you, you're just out to lunch. And so I'm wondering if, if anybody here might have um, a suggestion for me to help me with this talk. Well, what? right away, Jim, before you start, I want to recommend that you go and read the Rhode Island Geoengineering Act. It's It's got, it's it's long, but uh, there's just portions of it where she describes, I know the person who wrote the document. Julie she Diane. She describes, yeah, Susan, her name's Susan. Julie mm, Diane, Zero Geoengineering. Yeah, no, she, she didn't write You're, you're thinking of Suzanne Marr. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. Okay. Anyway, okay, okay. Uh, so go and just just pick up the language of it, uh, and um, and see all the list of things that she lists as far as far as what they want to prevent the geoengineering from bringing down on their people. 
and then you get a sense of what he just has probably never, if it's a he, and he probably has never recognized that it's this and this and this and, and, and just just use it to inspire you as to what to zero in on. That's what I, that's what I recommend. I have not read the uh, the uh, Tennessee one. I have not it's, seen it, it yet. It's literally like two. It's one run on sentence. That's so that's it's not it. like the Rhode Island one. The Rhode Island it, one was really excellent. Yeah. The, the, so Jolie Diane from ZeroGeoengineering.com put forth the Rhode Island one. It got sent to committee. It died there. Um, right. The New Hampshire bill happened. Um, they had a massive failure on day one. I covered it live, of course. And then Re Representative Jason Gerhard, um, we ended up talking on the phone and they came back to the second day um, of hearings. And because they changed their terminology and their approach, yeah. they were actually able to get through the mental blockade, which you're going to you're going to inevitably face with every politician because a they're not scientists B they're regular people and they tend to believe what you know every the consensus believes. So if you know when when you hit that mental wall and they say, but I was always taught this is condensation trails. This condensation is just water condensation. You got to hit them back with condensating on what. The different and then the, the typical argument that people will make is, well, here's a here's a bird breathing in cold temperature. That's condensation. But what happens? It disappears. It doesn't turn into a cloud. What makes a cloud? You have yeah. to have a chemical in the center of that water vapor that condenses and turns into ice. So the, the response to him is condenses on what? Now, what you need to focus on is not that which you can prove, but sowing doubt in the representative that he cannot prove his argument. Yeah. It is not on you to prove that you the chemicals are raining down on us. It is the government's fault, its malfeasance in not testing properly rainfall water samples or air. The, the fact that our governments, both Canada and the United States, have no system for testing rainfall at all. Um, when I was in, uh, when I went to the weather modification conference, uh, the 21st conference on planet inadvertent weather modification, um, I interviewed um, William Cotton, who steered hurricanes during Project Storm Fury, and a whole bunch of other geoengineers and scientists. I talked to James Roger Fleming, who wrote the the history of weather control. Um, but I talked to the guys at UCAR and NCAR. That's the National Corporation for Atmospheric Research. They are the head of all weather modification research in the world. They're in Boulder, Colorado. And when I went up to them and I said, they were building open source, um, you know, weather stations that people could build out of PVC pipes and giving them the schematics so they could build them themselves and put them anywhere in the world. And I asked them a simple question. Could we do single particle mass spectrometry on rainfall samples? And the dude literally turned red. I have this on videotape. You can see it. It's on climateviewer.com slash tag slash AMS 2018 or something like that. Um, but AMS 2018 is American Meteorological Society 2018. And the reason why is because that is where the, the silver bullet lies. If you force your representative to, it, you don't even have to have him admitted, but you have to just say from a logical standpoint, if there's pollution, poisonous pollution, because we know that metal nanoparticles are in jet fuel or burnt from jet fuel, make clouds, 75% of cloud seeds in those clouds are man-made metals. They are raining down on us. You have done nothing to ever test for any of this. Hopefully, if they actually get the equipment to test for it, they're never going to tell us. That's why I've been focused on you know building a citizen-powered network one you can buy and put in your own backyard. But what I would say to you know your representative is there has been no tests, zero, on what's in the rain coming down. And 
Um, Bettina has tried this herself. We've gone through why, you know, nothing was detect detected. The reason why is because any kind of water sample testing or air quality testing that's currently out there, they refer to it as PM 2.5 or particulate matter of a 2.5 micron. A nanometer a nanoparticle is 1000 times small. Well, 2000 times smaller than a 2.5 micron chemical. So between the expense of the equipment to, to actually test for nanoparticles in general and the government's lack of ever giving a fuck, um, that's why we are in this situation right now. So what I would say to them is this, look, every single day, I observe planes creating clouds that block out the sun. I also know for a fact that the chemicals in those clouds are highly toxic and there have been no environmental impact studies done by any agency on the planet ever. And it is your duty to protect us from pollution. That's why I focus on that topic, because it's a starting point. I want to get to the point where we can catch them spraying nanobugs, but fuck if we don't even start there with the most simplest argument that they are poisoning everybody on the planet. Just the commercial, av commercial aviation by itself, poisoning everything on the planet. That's why our bees are dying. That's why our trees are catching on fire like crazy. All of it. If we start there, we can eventually get to the point where we can single out individual bad actors that are intentionally geoengineering, intentionally spraying for X, Y, or Z, or experimenting on the public. But until we get to a point where we gather that data, the Tennessee ban that just occurred, it, will, it, it has no teeth whatsoever. The Federal Aviation Act um, basically prohibits states from interfering in interstate commerce or any airplane traffic whatsoever. I try to explain this to people afterwards. Of course, they don't want to hear it. They think that going the state route of passing laws is going to matter to the federal government. But the Weather Modification Policy Act of 1976 and the Weather Modification Reporting Act of 1972 clearly state that the federal government does not have to report to the states what it is doing in the areas of weather modification and climate engineering. I am certain that the Canadian government has a similar policy act. Dan is your man for that information. We went through it. I shared um, his five, three part series on the laws in Canada. You guys have a very similar policy that basically states the federal government can supersede any of the regional areas. Um, so even if you pass, like say one in Alberta and you just don't want it in BC, doesn't matter when the federal government can just override that. There are certain you know venues where that is the truth. And this is one of them, it's the sky. So when we're talking about the sky, the state doesn't have sovereignty over you know, doesn't own that column of air in its borders. That's not a thing anymore. So that's where I, where I would start is I see clouds. They're coming from planes. They affect crop production. They affect um, solar uptake. My so make it personal. Lie, bullshit the guy. My solar panels aren't working because these freaking planes keep blocking out the sun and my kids are getting ill. I did some studies. The, the jet engine, the jet aircraft uh, fuel is highly toxic, has Sarah 313 chemicals. According to the EPA, that's cancer-causing chemicals. Circla chemicals, also cancer-causing chemicals. They are being sprayed on us to the tune of 16 million barrels per day, 130,000 flights per day, uh, 39.5 million flights per year. That's where I would start. Hit them with the numbers and the fact that they have done nothing to protect us from these chemicals. Or if you want to really punch them in the balls, 
just um, go to climateviewer.com slash serious clouds matter. I've got five different peer reviewed journal entries that say Greenland ice sheet melts more when it's cloudy. Hit them with the 9-11 report on how the diurnal temperature range changes because of cirrus clouds. When planes make cirrus clouds, that is the only greenhouse there is. We do not live in a closed system. We live in an open system. A closed system is a greenhouse. Why? Because it has glass or plastic and the heat comes in and gets trapped on the way out. That's why it's warmer in a greenhouse. Greenhouse gases are not a thing. You can go to CO2coalition.org. Um, Dr. William Happer, um, Dr. Willie Soon, Climate, the movie just came out. Um, if you if nobody's seen it yet, it is freaking phenomenal. The best summary of all of this I've ever seen. Um, but clearly, the CO2 agenda is falling apart. And we know that planes creating artificial clouds modify the weather and the temperature at ground level to a greater extent than all of the greenhouse gases combined. And Olivier Boucher from the IPCC, who writes the freaking reports on this, said so when I testified at the EPA back in 2015. So this is not even a, a question anymore. The question is, are they willing to do something about toxic nanoparticles filling our sky? And, and will bodies. we ever, yeah, I mean, it what you showed it what goes up must come down if it ends up in the stratosphere its residence time is anywhere from two months to two years if it's in the troposphere you know below the tropopause where all the weather occurs in the world is very turbulent two to four months so any of those chemicals those nanoparticles they live about two to four months before you're breathing them and you think your organic garden is organic hell no so I agree with Alana. There is no natural weather because between large scale cloud seeding projects like the Chinese covering the entire Tibetan plateau in 100 to 200,000 cloud seeding generators. In the United States, we have approximately three to 5,000 cloud seeding generators along the Rocky Mountains. We are, we are changing the weather on a global scale every single day. So, of course, none of this is natural. Um, I would just try to not overwhelm him because politicians are kind of like cockroaches when you turn the lights on in the middle of the night and they tend to run and scurry away and then shove some, you know, intern out there to say um, he's busy. You know, I'll take your message and we'll get back to you. Um, try to just, you know, speak in the lowest common tongue. You know what I mean? Keep it simple, stupid is the oldest saying for a reason. Get them engaged by asking questions. Don't make definitive statements. Why hasn't the government ever tested the rainfall? Why are you not testing for nanoparticles? Why, why, why? That's Great. the best approach that I've found with dealing with politicians, with dealing with scientists. Chris Vaughn thought I was a fucking nut until I literally hit him with so many honest questions um, that he could not answer. And then he finally, we, we developed a relationship and he was the director of harp and he was up there doing air glow experiments. And I told him, I said, I don't agree with anything you're doing. Like you should not be fucking with the ionosphere. Like, what are you doing, man? But he was a radio frequency, you know, nerd, and he enjoyed what he did. He thought it was cool math. I don't see these, you know, I don't see all these people as angels and demons. I see people in shades of gray. We all have evil. We all have a capacity for good. And even some of the geoengineers that I've talked to, I honestly believe that some of the people, and I'll even say David Keith, David Keith, love him or hate him, the son of a bitch honestly thinks that global warming is real and that this may be the only way to save the planet. He honestly believes that shit. Yeah, I know. That's the scary part about him. And just like with Robert Oppenheimer, Robert Oppenheimer believed that they would save more lives than they took by creating the atom bomb. They believed that they 
could save more lives and end World War III by creating the nuclear bomb. And boy, did that turn out wrong. And boy, did he regret it. Because look where we are today. Right. Quick note, sorry to interrupt here. Uh, we filed an FOI a long time ago. It was actually in July or August of last year, and it finally hit our inbox. It was a very big and detailed um, FOI, and it came back. It is 285 pages because I was asking, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> so um, anyway, so it's on our website on uh, geoengineeringfreecanada.com. Dan, Dan, get on that right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assigning I'm assigning that to Dan. I actually already looked at it uh <laughs> to my page. I did. It's a big honestly it's a big nothing burger because they, it's all about roundup if that's the one you're talking about Bettina and it's it's like to me they just r almost randomly chose this like roundup roundup spraying you know uh glyphosate and all and and the other aquest uh, i forget the name so you, the you asked for aerial spraying and they gave you herbicide nice oh, sons of bitches <laughs> i'm gonna have to go everybody well two hours is my max i'm, yeah. I'm dying here Absolutely. Well, Alana, it was it was such a pleasure. Well, thank you so much for coming. Oh, it was great. It was great. Great presentation, Alana. Great presentation. Yeah, and Jim and I got to to spar. I love it. I love it. All right. <laughs> I love you, Alana. Love you. You know that. I know. I know. Okay, everyone. Blessings. Good night. Good night, Alana. Well, good night. And when you have the when you have the tape, send me a copy, and I'll post it. I will. Absolutely. I will. Well, whoever wants to stay on, more than welcome to. If there's anybody who wants to chat more and more and more, we can probably go on forever. Troy, is there anything else you would like to add? No, I think that um, I already had a ton of information, right? I have is uh, I, I talked to Bettina about this last week and she sent me a bunch of information and I already had uh, quite a bit, but um, some of the stuff, uh, some of the stuff that was discussed tonight, I'd never, never really considered um, some of it and put it all together. But um, yeah, I, I don't want to go into great detail. I want to keep it simple, 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 stupid, and um, just try to make it a, make it as easy for like a five year old to understand. So um, I think that um, the stuff that uh, Jim pointed out will really be helpful, and I really appreciate that, Jim. Thank you. And and Dan, the links I, I saved those links. I'll be uh, Checking them out as well. Thank you. Yeah, Dan's yeah. definitely got uh, Dan's got could, the goods, man. Go ahead, Dan. Yeah, I was just going to mention it. Like uh, Troy, I, I don't know to what extent you you know you're familiar with Jim's work, but uh, actually, I was in Cuba a couple of weeks ago, and I had planned on doing absolutely zero work, just totally disconnecting from the internet. But the only work I did was actually watch uh, Jim's. A video interview with Del Big Tree. So Troy and I took a bunch of notes. Uh, so Troy, I would strongly encourage you to watch that particular uh, interview because for me personally, it just answered so many questions and doubts I had and holes in in my own kind of reasoning and everything. And uh, that's where I saw that particular chart also. It looks like the periodic table of elements that uh, Jim uh, masterfully prepared. So uh, I, I would like, yeah, sure, use the KISS rule, keep it simple, but maybe you can just print a few materials. Uh, that ch particular chart I would bring and maybe you can leave it to him. Maybe Jim has thoughts on that. And I also put I'll give you a link directly document. to it. You can download it. Yeah. And uh, without getting too complicated, uh, the other uh, interview I watched was uh, with uh, Jim and the pilot from uh, that has 53 years <laughs> flying experience, Graham Hood. And in that video, uh, Jim brought up uh, something very interesting. It was from the Royal uh was it the royal aeronautical society and yeah. there was this there was a slight pdf called greener design 
And he mentioned that something very important that the, he did not have during the Dell Big Tree interview, but he, as a viewer or commenter, pointed to him. Pointed a member of my PDF Telegram to chat. Him. With the yeah, with the cooling contrails controversy, uh, controversy slide, uh, which compares the avoiding warming contrails with creating uh, cooling contrails. But the reason I mentioned this now is is not to complicate things. Uh, it's just to ask Jim if he was aware because that that dates from 2021. But I found a a, a briefing paper from the same Royal Aeronautical Society that dates from April, 2023 called Contrails and Contrail Management Greener by Design Specialist Group. And this is the, I put the quotes in the, in the chat area here and unless I'm reading it incorrectly, uh, they have, a, a, in, I'll just read two quick passages. In their introduction, they have, however, it is now time to also consider the largest net warming component of aviation's emissions, namely contrails and contrail-induced cirrus clouds. And on page three, they have a big call out in orange font color, very big. Very short sentence, but very telling, unless I'm, I'm misreading it. It says, quote, the current overall effect of contrails and contrails cirrus is a net warming hyphen about 1.5 times that of aviation's CO2. So uh, maybe Jim can correct me, but uh, the way I read it, in other words, they're saying the aggregate aircraft induced contrail cirrus clouds uh, have a warming effect that is one and a half times greater than the actual CO2 emissions produced from the aircraft themselves. Would that be correct, Jim, or am I misreading that? Um, they're kind of downplaying it. Um, if you if you want to look at it, and this this will give you some good talking points. I'll drop this in chat. But this was my speech to the EPA in 2015, and. Um, it's it's actually much worse than they're 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 making it out. I mean they they've tried they always try to round down the numbers, but um <laughs> this is these are the two main quotes. Um contrails formed by aircraft can evolve into cirrus clouds indistinguishable from those formed naturally. These spreading contrails may be causing more climate warming today than all the carbon dioxide emitted by aircraft since the start of aviation. And I have reference numbers for these, like you'll see it right there on my speech. Another researcher said, and this was Olivier Boucher, a single aircraft operating conditions favorable for persistent contrail formation appears to exert a contrail induced radiated forcing some 5,000 times greater than recent estimates of the average persistent contrail radiative forcing from the entire civil aviation fleet. To put it another way, they tried to assume how much sunlight was either being reflected or trapped. And that's called albedo. Is it SRM? Is it solar radiation management? Or is it earth radiation management, which is called cirrus cloud thinning? These are the two major stratospheric aerosol injection. That's SRM, cirrus cloud thinning. That's dealing with the chemtrails that they're telling you are just water vapor. Chill out. You put your tinfoil hat on. Shut up. Um, Olivier Boucher came to the conclusion that a single plane was trapping more heat, 5,000 times more heat than their estimate was for every single plane in the air together. They were that wrong about it. So now that they've come to these conclusions and these largely came about as a result of um, um, some research that was done around 9-11, during the 9-11 groundings, uh, you know, after they crashed into the, the, tw the Twin Towers, they grounded all flights in the United States for three days. During that three-day period, the diurnal temperature range widened greatly. 
So what that means is where it would normally be 70 degrees during the day and then say 50 degrees at night, it was 70 during the day and it dropped down to like 40 or maybe even 35 at night. I'm using Fahrenheit. Sorry for all you Celsius people. Um, <laughs> go do the math yourself. I don't Celsius, unfortunately. Um, the point is that they realized in any redneck around here or anybody who's ever been outside at night recognizes that on nights where it's cloudy, it's warmer. The reason why is because when long wave radiation makes its way to the surface of the planet, normally at night on a clear starry night, it's colder partially because the fact that humidity is coming down by the way you're breathing all those nanoparticles at that point. Um, but also it's cooler because that heat is able to escape back into space. Back to the point I said, we're not in a closed system. We are not in a greenhouse. The only greenhouse is clouds. Um, Svensmark is another brilliant individual who's talked about the climate cloud conundrum. Um, and the, the reality, this in Willie soon, Dr. Willie soon and Dr. William Happer also agree on this. Um, in the world of climate change, it comes down to this solar activity, cosmic rays, cloud formation, water vapor, CO2 or greenhouse gases. That's what affects the temperature of the planet, the weather of the planet, cosmic rays, the, the, the sun affects our ionosphere. The ionosphere is our shield of the Starship Enterprise. If it weren't for that force field, cosmic rays would fry us all to death in an instant. Whenever the shield is weakened, those cosmic rays penetrate more deeply during solar minimums. During solar maximums, the ionosphere is highly charged. There's more energy available. That's when Tesla would say, hey, bro, we can get all the free energy we want, and there's way more of it right now. Um, but during a solar minimum, you know, we have a weakened sun, we have a weakened ionosphere, cosmic rays tend to penetrate more deeply, we have more cloud cover. Because in order to make clouds, you need three things. You need water vapor, you need cosmic rays, and you need a cloud seed, something for it to stick to. So with that combination is what drives the climate. That's what that's where climate change may be a, you know human related, but reality, the sun way overpowers all that. In fact, there are studies that if you watch climate the movie, this one even blew my mind. Where our solar system is in the Milky Way and as it passes through the bands of the Milky Way coincide with the hot um peaks that have happened over the last couple billion years so how much do we have to do with this very little but can we screw with the weather on a worldwide basis any given day you darn right we can but long-term trends um that's kind of out of our power at this point so i go back to focus on that which you can control you can control lobbying the hell out of your government to do something about the airline industry, which has never had any kind of regulations or lawsuits levied against them for their pollution. That's where you start. And they already are feeling the pressure. That's why you're seeing things like the Contrail Avoidance Group, Greener by Design. That's why you're seeing Ulrich Schumann from Germany's DLR saying, let's make less warming, more cooling contrails predictable for operational planning. They want to stall as long as they can. And they love us arguing about the C word and calling it geoengineering and saying it's all a secret government program because it gives them cover to continue to do what they've been doing all along. Plain what? farts and clouds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Is there anybody else? Uh, yeah. Okay. We've got another question here. Daryl, go ahead. I'll just uh, say that uh, we're in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, small city, about 250,000 people in the heart of the prairies. And uh, there's nothing random about our 
uh, harp tarp, as I call it, or our gray tarp that's over our city practically every day. And uh, I've been monitoring this for uh, well over eight months now. There's a fellow in Edmonton named Jim Albert who's been monitoring it for five years. And there's no, there's no accident, there's no uh, random sequence of commercial jets that are causing it to be right over the largest city in Saskatoon. You go 15 or 20 miles out of the city and you've got blue skies. We can actually see the lines around the city some days. It's absolutely like somebody threw a tarp right on it. It's, it's, uh, it, it, there is a lot of constant planes flying here. We're a small city. We don't have a lot of air traffic. And so, um, and we're trying to find out where these planes come from. Like, where are these? Are they coming from Old Lake, Alberta, and the military base there? Are they coming from, uh, you know, where where are they coming from? Because we don't have a lot of commercial air, uh, airline traffic in, uh, in this province. So, um, yeah, Saskatoon has an international airport there. It's called international airport. We have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just looking at it right now. I'm just yeah. curious. I, I'm always curious. There, there's there's people that track the planes uh, through the what do you call them? The, one of these the, you know those apps that says that there's a lot of them that are flying up there that aren't on aren't on the radar. They're they're not they're not numbered. They're not tracked. There's no way we can track them um try this guy out right here i'm dropping it in chat all the yes exchange yeah all the other ones are crap yeah and uh i have a question uh, for jim about that and maybe you in saskatoon you you can use this to see if they have military planes because uh this is a question i i asked jim and jim don't worry i know you're very busy (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so don't feel bad for not replying my email, but uh, like right over my city, over my house here, there was a U.S. military straddle tanker, or case, if a case uh, C-35, if I'm not mistaken, a straddle tanker. This is yeah. for refueling, <laughs> you know, like military jets. I have no idea what it was. There's doing. one I, headed I towards a... Ontario right now. <laughs> I made I made a like a, a media inquiry to both Transport Canada and the Department of National Defense with many details, including photographs and video and the screenshots of the ADBS exchange and all that. This plane had no call sign, um, and yeah. they completely ignored my request. So I don't know, Jim. Do you have any ideas what the hell a, a straddle tanker was doing above my city and uh, leaving long long trails? Of course, but. Any, any well, thoughts, ideas? The, um, <laughs> the, the Canadian, um, is it the Royal Air? No, that's oh, Royal Royal Air Force. Force. Yeah. Is, is it still the Canadian Royal Air, Air Force? Still the Air Force. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, they, they hold j- joint exercises. Um, basically, you have to understand that the relationship between the U.S. and Canada is they are part of the five eyes. So, being a Five Eyes member means you're at the tip top of the world. Um, the United States, U.S., Canada, New Zealand, Australia. It's it was a referred to as Ozcan Zuckus um, as far back as 1970. Um, this followed World War II with the um, U.S. U.K. Uh, agreement to share all signals intelligence. It grew to the Five Eyes then the nine eyes and now the 13 eyes. Um, But basically we actually have something called the ABCA army as well, which is America, Britain and Canada joint army. So basically the United States military and the Canadian military are pretty much one in the same. Um, So if you see a KC-135 flying over Canada, it's probably refueling canadian fighter planes that are up there doing experiment you know doing testing you know preparedness um i live near shaw air force base we have planes constantly taking off and going to a bombing range i don't know if you got a bombing range anywhere near you but the point is they go up they fly for hours they practice refueling um refueling practice is a normal thing because in wartime you might be required to stay aloft you know, for 24 hours. 
Um, and a, a pilot will be regularly tested on their ability to stay in a plane for 24 hours. I mean, imagine being stuck in a F-16 or, you know, F-35 um, for 24 hours, and you got to go up and refuel four or five times during that um, period. Um, so, yeah, I, I see it regularly. Um, you know, we got K-35s and KC-135s. Um, there's a C-130 just now leaving Canada. Um, but yeah, if you, if you just go to, when you go to your ADSV exchange, there's a, a U H and a T icon right at the top of the screen. If you click on U, that'll filter out everything, but military planes. So that's a good way to start. But even so, um, flight radar will take, um, let's say celebrities off of there, um, politicians, um, ADSB exchange is unique in that it is an open source networks of, um, you, you can't even see the States. It's a fact. I mean, like it's, it's a blanket down here. Um, so what I would think, you know, when I'm looking at Saskatoon, um, right here in Saskatchewan, you can see that there are several international flight, um, pass and you can actually turn on um the highways in the sky if you want to ever actually look at these things to find out what what are called air service routes um what they are so you can get used to where you should be expecting to see um these planes flying Th this is what leads to the grids in the sky is that basically the 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 operators that control where these flights are routed um, they're all pretty much flying on the same, you know, line. Some of them might be at, at you know, 10,000 feet worth of different altitude, but they're flying by, you know, there's, there's visual flight and then there's a, basically automated flight and 99% of flights out there are automated flights. So they go up, they take off. That's all manual. Once they get up, they punch in the numbers that the people told them to do. And the plane flies its damn self to wherever it's going. Yep. And they can remotely control um, how much fuel is burned per hour at what altitude and all of these things. And when you consider what Dan brought up earlier, that when the contrail avoidance group is talking about, let's make cooler contrails during the day by intentionally flying into super size, super saturated regions, they recognize that creating clouds at night trap heat and that if they create clouds during the day, they can claim that they're cooling the planet as long as they're gone by nightfall. This is a carbon tax scam. And that's my personal opinion. If you look at it and you follow the money because climate change, because carbon taxes they can get what are called carbon offsets or carbon credits by saying, yes, we emit a lot of CO2 and you guys think that's a naughty thing, but look what we did with our clouds. We're cooling by day. We're not making clouds at night on trail avoidance group. We're not making clouds at night. So we're not trapping heat at night anymore. So our net benefit to society is we're using our pollution as a geoengineering solution. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that part makes sense. Yeah, just the uh, the the the, uh, the the tarp that goes over our city, <laughs> like you can go north, south, east, west, and it's not anywhere else. Twenty miles. I'll, I'll tell you the exact opposite. I live in Sumter, South Carolina. I live near Shaw Air Force Base. I work in the next county which is literally a 25 minute drive. Okay. My city, my sky is pristine. Damn near every day, all day, air day, uh, all year long. Very rarely do I ever see any kind of persistent contrail plane farts making blocking out the sun. But when I drive over that Sumter County border into Manning and I'm going to work, I can literally walk out the front door of the government building that I'm protecting with my pistol and look up and it's tic-tac-toe world. And it's only 25 minutes between here and there. Right. 
The reason why it happens here is because we have an Air Force base and we have a bombing range. And if you look at that, those are called NOTAMs or Notice to Airmen, um, a.k.a. no-fly zones. So what ends up happening is because all the planes are routed around Sumter, they all get squished into a nice little box right over Manning. And they get, basically, they get shit on because our military doesn't want planes flying and violating military airspace. There may be something similar happening with you. I'm I'm not familiar with the area. I don't I don't have all the answers, but think of you know try to think of these kind of alternative explanations because every time I've you know thought I had it figured out, I realized I was freaking wrong. <laughs> but and and I could be wrong, you know. Like I'm not there. I'm not observing what you're observing. You know what I mean? It's an individual perspective kind of thing. But I would at least try um, ADSB exchange. You may find a lot more luck with being able to track the flights. The other thing is, you know, if you really want to know, go buy yourself a Nikon Coolpix P900. Um, I can go grab the camera if you want to see it. But, you know, 83 times optical zoom. The P1000 has 105 times optical zoom. Um, one's about $500. The other is about a thousand dollars but even though they were made like five years ago they're still the best optical you know long range optical zoom you can buy in a single camera where you don't have to go buy some monstrous telescopic lens and put it on a tripod you can just whip it out and zoom right in and smile at the pilot right right yeah yeah i've, I've seen those on videos so people using them yeah so good well thank you Thank you. No problem, man. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Well, then I guess it's been two and a half hours. That's been great. And I'm so grateful. I I'm still I'm I'm totally overwhelmed that this was happening today. Um I I I I don't know. I don't know what to say. I'm grateful. Thank you very much for for everybody. Is there anything else we should discuss before we wrap it up? It's like I say, it's almost uh yeah, it's been two and a half hours now. Daryl, just want on one note, please get in touch uh, so we can set up something and we can yeah. we can talk and and that kind of thing. All right. So I saved the chat. Um, I stopped the recording now, and it's going to be up. And um, and uh, whoops and.